Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be reviewing Loud Silence by Heady Mix, Diverse Stories for Curious Minds. So this is actually part of a new bookish subscription box. I'll link below to my video where I unboxed it and also to where you can find more information. And basically they're going to focus on like a different, either a disability or things like LGBTQ issues, inequalities, that sort of thing. Um, anything that needs highlighting really and so they're going to focus on a different thing each box the box this one this was the first box and they asked me if i'd be interested in reviewing it uh, was all about deafness so we have here loud silence takes the reader on a journey that explores identity representation and communication it brings together writers from the deaf community in a collection that asks the reader to challenge the notion that the absence of sound is silence and indeed i think i have a sticky note to talk some more about that so the contents here well i'll just go through we've got the introduction here by justina crookshank and she starts by defining loud and silence. And uh, I'm going to read this little introductory bit here. Loud silence. Two words seldom seen together. A juxtaposition that may seem jarring. Can silence, the absence of sound, be loud? Hearing people frequently require silence. Shushing in the theatre. Finger to lips at playing children or brows furrowed in concentration. Silence is a punishment. Go to your room and think about your actions, or something hard to achieve and yearn for as city dwellers escape to the country looking for no reception, seeking solace from the hum of city life and dinging of their phones. They're too loud, people mutter in staff rooms, judging colleagues. That loud noise scared me, share children, and sometimes we don't want to say things out loud. The English language is as limited as it is expressive, far too often because hearing people don't hear sound when sign language is communicated, it is implied there is no voice. The absence of sound. Silence. So I thought this was quite interesting here, uh, again still in the introduction. One of the things I will mention, you know, there's fiction here and there are also things like the introduction and then there are essays. And actually for me it was the essays I was most interested in, you'll see why in a little bit, but um, I'm going to read this bit out. The deaf community, with hands and fingers moving flawlessly, shaping stories via the 300 plus sign languages around the world, is a community with a rich history and strong identity despite the many biases, stereotypes and barriers determined to make life harder than it needs to be. The English language is sound biased. Many of its communication words relate to sound. Talk, speak, hear, listen. Also, think about pr phrases such as fall on deaf ears or they're deaf as a post. One of the biggest surprises when I was researching the Loud Silence collection was to discover that in the UK, British Sign Language, BSL, does not have legal status. This is a language used by 151,000 people in the UK, 87,000 of whom are deaf. The UK government accorded protected language status to six indigenous UK languages, Welsh, Scots, Ulster Scots, Scottish, Irish, Gaelic and Cornish. So why not BSL, argues the British Deaf Association. And I tend to agree. I also agree. That seems self-evident. Like, I don't... <laughs> why is that not a thing? Okay, here we have I Am Not Deaf by Michael Uniake. Uh, that is a total guess about how to pronounce his surname. And this is fiction... So let's see what I've tabbed here. So this is about him getting his like first hearing aid, except he really does not like having the hearing aid. And I want to read this little paragraph. I think this shows the like how disconcerting it was, but also because part of the reason about this is to highlight the fact that I suppose amongst non-deaf people, the perception is that, you know, especially with cochlear implants, which are talked about later, that, you know, it's just something that a medical procedure or whatever and you switch it on and suddenly they can hear and everything is fine they're cured you know and the argument is kind of like well well you'll see what the argument is but anyway this is what happened after he uh, he got his new his new hearing aid i did not like this new world it threw up sounds that intruded sounds that told me about things i did not need to know the softness of the world i knew had gone and in its place were edges harsh and sharp I flung myself onto the grass, and the hearing aid protested with a dull scraping groan, a noise squeezed out between my chest and the ground. I could see each blade of grass poking from the soil to form a dense miniature jungle. An ant skittered by, small and black, clambering up and down and across the green blades of grass. I thought that maybe I could hear the tiny skittering and grasping as its minuscule legs and feet scrabbled for traction on the fibres of the blades of grass. But through the wind noise, the sighing of the trees and the distant rumbling of traffic, I couldn't be sure. I also think like little details like that are kind of the point of own voices, you know, books really. Because it's kind of covered in some of the later essays in terms of like people with regular hearing or whatever, whatever, however you want to define it. Um, when they write about deaf characters and what they tend to focus on is very different to what you would focus on if you were a deaf author writing about a deaf character. And I think that that idea of 
the, the noise being overwhelming, I don't think a person without any form of hearing impairment um, could write that. I mean, I think you could write that even if you were, you know, deaf in one ear or you had tinnitus or something like that. But if you have regular hearing, and then he's talking about singing hymns and basically he got some of the words and the hymns wrong. And he says, from then on, I sang the hymns very softly, just in case anyone could hear that I didn't know the words. I used to sing hymns very softly at school when we had to do them. But that was because I wasn't religious and I resented having to sing religious songs at school. Here we have Body Language by Jessica White. And I think this is like pretty uh, autobi autobiographical because the main character is called uh, Jessica. And uh, Jessica's studying feminism and fiction. And uh, it says this. After the barrier of disembodied sound, the silence of the corridor was soothing. Jessica always had difficulty with hearing men's voices, for their registers were lower. Sometimes she wondered if this was the reason she'd become interested in feminism. Women were simply easier to understand. We have this bit in this story as well, so... Let me pose a question, I suggested. If a fairy godmother offered you your hearing, would you take it? Well, deafness has made me who I am. You mean, an opinionated, obnoxious, feminist thinker and writer? Yes, exactly. So perhaps I wouldn't take it. And where would you be without silence, which has given you the space in which to think, and which has shaped you as a writer? Without silence, you wouldn't have turned to words. And then there's an actual, uh, I, I think this is a, re yeah, this is a reference, so which is quite cool that, like, this is like a story that's also an essay. For deaf people, silence has often been yoked together with negative connotations. It's a cave, a prison, a tomb. Sometimes it can feel like this, but as you know, at other times it's liberating. You don't have to listen to someone yakking on their mobile phone on the bus, nor overhear your flatmate having loud sex in the room above. You can simply switch off your hearing aid and keep reading your book or thinking your thoughts. In a somewhat similar situation, Stephen Hawking, the theoretical physicist, has said that his disability has given him the advantage of having more time to think. Although Susan Wendell points out that he is only able to do this because of the help of his family, three nurses, a graduate student who travels with him to maintain his computer communication systems, resources which are unavailable to many disabled people. So yeah, it's a story and then it's got references at the end, which is cool. Here we have Do Androids Dream of Electric Speech by Pamela Kinchelo. And this is sort of about the convergence of humans and technology and about how some of the discrimination towards deaf people in society could be through this sort of subconscious thing of people see them as almost cyborgs because they've got cochlear implants or whatever, you know, it's like the same as you see someone wearing Google Glass and it's like, oh, what's that? That's different. And that immediately gets somebody singled out. So this, we're talking a lot about cochlear implants and I thought this little bit was interesting. For example, at this point in time, there isn't even a word or term in American culture for someone with an implant. I struggle with how to phrase it in this essay. Implantee, recipient, there are no neat labels. In the USA, you can call a person deaf, deaf with a capital D, the D representing a specific cultural and political identity, hearing impaired, hard of hearing, and each gradation implies, for better or worse, some kind of subject position. There are no such terms for a person who gets an implant. Are people with implants, as suggested above, just deaf? Deaf with a capital D? Are they hard of hearing? There is even debate in the American Sign Language community as to what signs should be used to indicate someone who has a cochlear implant. So I thought this was interesting as well. It's looking heavily at the portrayal of deafness in kind of in the media. But one expects a hyper-sentimentalized portrayal of just about everything in daytime dramas like this. What is interesting is that when people with CIs have appeared on several reality programs, which, which purport to offer real, unadulterated glimpses into people's lives, the, rhetor the rhetoric is no less sentimentalized than the soaps perhaps because these shows are no less fabricated. A good example of this is the widely watched and, I think, ironically named show True Life, which appears on MTV. This is a series that claims to tell the remarkable real-life stories of young people and the unusual subcultures they inhabit. In episode 42, True Life, I'm Deaf, part of the show follows a young man, Chris, born deaf and proud of it, his words, who decides to get a cochlear implant because he wants to be involved in the hearing world. Through an interpreter, Chris explains that he wants an implant so he can communicate with his friends, talk with girls, and ultimately fulfill his dreams of having a job and getting married. One has to ask, are these things he can't do without an implant? The show's promo asks, how do you go from living a life in total silence to fully understanding the spoken language? The statement alone contains two elements common to the miracle rhetoric. First, that the tragic deaf victim will emerge from a completely lonely, silent place, not true, most deaf people have some residual hearing. And if you watch the so and if you watch the show you see Chris signing, speaking voluminously, to seamlessly, miraculously, fully joining and understanding the hearing world. Chris, it seems, will only come into full being when he is able to join the hearing world. In this case, the CI will cure what ails him, according to true life.
And then they have some quite fr- frankly ridiculous examples from things like CSI, which I'm ashamed to say, like, I recognise some of them as well. And in hindsight, I'm like, yeah, that was not well written. So here we have Lip Reading by Michael Uniake. And this is about just his family sort of sending him to lip reading, really. I didn't flag anything in that, but not that it's a bad piece. It's just quite short. We have Old Honey by Jessica White. I didn't fl- flag anything that in that one again either, just because, again, it's mainly the essays I've really enjoyed from this. So we have Not Silent, Invisible, Literature's Chance Encounters with Deaf Heroes and Heroines by Donna MacDonald. And I noticed, actually, that a lot of these essays use the same examples, and the reason for that is that there just aren't many examples of deafness in you know, in popular culture. I mean, I was thinking when I when I was, when I I was picked this up, the only one that I can think of is uh, El Defo by C.C. Bell. I know Stephen King's had some deaf characters as well, but obviously that's not uh, own voices or whatever. And again, we have a lot of, uh, we have a lot of references for each of these essays so you can follow up to. We have In Books, Everything Made Sense by Michael Uniake. I did enjoy that one actually, but that's just two little paragraphs there. Combustion by Jessica White. The Silence of Sounds by Donna MacDonald. Uh, in in this essay, actually, she mentioned one particular story where um, Se- uh, Vic- I think it's Vikram Sethi says there is something tender and indefinably strange and searching about her playing, as if she is attending to something beyond my hearing. The idea is is that as a, a reader, you might think that it's um, just his exper- her experience of he- hearing music. One of the cool things about that, she referenced a scene in one of these books as well, where there's a reference to uh, the main character is like. Uh, it's like she wasn't even listening to me, and it's because she couldn't hear, but he didn't know, you know. Here we have Lady Sings the Blues by Elizabeth A. Ward as well, and a few others as well, and we've got, obviously got the bios at the end. But um, yeah, overall, I did enjoy this. I gave this a pretty solid 4 out of 5, and I would recommend you check out the uh, subscription box, which, again, I'll put the info below. Full, full disclosure, they sent it to me for free to try it out, but I only tried it out because I was interested, and it's uh, lived up to my ex- expectations and then some. So there we have it, that's my review of Loud Silence by Heady Mix. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments if you'll be checking out the the subscription set, I guess, because I don't think you can get this anywhere else. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video, hit subscribe for more, and I'll see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.